when uh, Jesus was on the earth, children came to him. So many children, aren't you encouraged that we have a God that when he came to the earth in the form of Jesus, the children liked being around him? Isn't that good? And they liked being around him so much that he would bless the children. And the disciples actually came to a point where they were like, get all these kids away. You know, we've got got important things to do. And what did Jesus say? He said, no, let the kids come to me. He said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. As a matter of fact, unless you accept the kingdom of God as one of these little children, you will not be worthy of my kingdom. There's something about a child and the way a child interacts in life. God wants us to be that very same way, to stay childlike before him to come into his kingdom. There was a time when he would bless the children. There's no evidence in scripture that he baptized children, although I grew up Catholic, and so uh, the, the uh, tradition there is that as a child, you're, you're sprinkled with water, but there is evidence in scripture that he blessed children. So we like to bless children and encourage parents and dedicate our children to the Lord. There's another story where Hannah was asking for a child and then dedicated that child to the Lord. She was unable to have children, but she dedicated this child to the Lord, Samuel, and that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, I want to talk about a way that you can have 100% of your prayers answered. Are you interested in this at all? That, it's, it's just a flashy title. There's no way you can have 100% of your prayers answered. It's just a title. I'm saying that if we follow the example of Hannah, she had her prayer answered, and there's things that we can learn from the way that she prayed and where she prayed and how she interacted with God. Her prayer was answered, so I'm saying uh, 100% of your prayers can be answered, but don't believe it. It's just a flashy title of a pastor. Uh, and plus, you don't want 100% of your prayers answered. Some of you, when you were in high school, you were dating somebody, and you prayed, dear God, let this be the one, but that wasn't the one, and you're thankful right now, aren't you, that he didn't answer that prayer? Yeah, I know. My wife is extremely excited. She was dating this bum. His name was Chris. (laughs) And is she blessed now or what? (laughs) I didn't say that in the other services, but we're having fun now. (laughs) I need to move on is what I need to do. (laughs) we don't want all of our prayers to be answered because a lot of times we don't know what we're saying when we're praying we're trying our best but we want to interact with the father we want to pray in such a way that we're praying in line with who he is and what his desires are and so in this story of Hannah we see that she's pouring her heart out to the Lord and there's a prayer that's answered and I want to just kind of unpack this But uh, just before we get into the word, Lord, I just want to ask you for your help today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, the family of God, the church that that you've uh, made. And uh, it's your desire that we come together this way and worship you and give and then hear from your word. So, uh, Lord, the things that you talk to us about through the power of your Holy Spirit, those are the things that will act on the things that we do. Thank you, Lord, that you have the ability to speak to each and every one of us today. And uh, we're just open to you and what you would say. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity and this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's look at the story. 1 Samuel chapter 1, 1 through 3, it says this. There was a man named Elkanah who lived in Ramah in the hill country of Ephraim. Elkanah had two wives. You ever seen, what's that show called? Sister Wives? Does this ever work? Ever, never does this ever work. Even in scripture, you'll see. Had two wives. Hannah and Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah did not. Each year, Elkanah would travel to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of Heaven's armies at the tabernacle. The priests of the Lord at that time were the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. There's a really great story on them. We're not going to get into it. Here's the point. They went to Shiloh. Every year they went to Shiloh, they went to the place where the tabernacle of God was, the Ark of the Covenant was there, and the Tent of Meeting. 
If you remember, when the children of Israel came uh, out of bondage, out of Egypt, it was on Mount Sinai that he told Moses, God told Moses, I want you to build this tabernacle where I'm going to meet with you. It's where the priests will offer sacrifices, the people will gather, there will be feasts and there will be sacrifices and festivals, and I will be there with you. I'll lead you by a, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, and they, they would pick up and they would move when the cloud moved, when God moved, they moved. They went where where God wanted them to go, and they roamed through the wilderness, and they would set up this temporary tabernacle everywhere they went. It was the meeting place of God. When Joshua led the people into the promised land, they set it up for seven years in a place called Gilgal. It was there for about seven years, but then I'm saying this because Shiloh is significant. For 369 years, the tabernacle would dwell at Shiloh. Joshua and all of the 12 tribes would gather together, and actually it is the place where they would decide, here's how we're going to apportion the promised land to the people of God. This was a significant place and a significant tabernacle for over 300 years in Shiloh. I had the opportunity for the first time um, the last, you know, I've been out the last couple of weeks. I was in Israel for 11 days, and I was actually among uh, our travels. I was able to stand in the place where they believed that tabernacle was to be standing for over 300 years. I was right in the place. It was really neat. It was really neat to think that Hannah had prayed there. And the people of God had gathered there. It was neat to think that Joshua was there and that they had divided the land so many years ago and all of the rich history. I'll tell you what was really great, though. Being a follower of Jesus, the fact that when we ask Christ to come into our life, the Holy Spirit indwells us that we, the body of Christ, are his new tabernacle. That I didn't go to Israel to meet Jesus. I took Jesus with me to Israel. I didn't go there and meet him. Somebody asked me when I, when I went there, I said, yeah, it was job related. Was it job related? I said, yeah, my boss used to work, uh, live there. So <laughs> I had to, go, had to go there. But we don't go to, to visit him there. We take him with us. We are now the living stones. We are the tabernacle. But I was there in Shiloh, and it was really neat. Uh, matter of fact, uh, let me pause this message for a commercial. We're going to take a trip. My wife and I are going to lead in October. And if you're interested, go to the website, scroll down. It says Best of Israel Tour. And if you'd like to be a part of that, we'd love to have you uh, with us. Here's what we notice about Hannah's prayer. Back to your regularly scheduled message now. God answers our prayers according to his plans. Have you ever noticed this? You have a plan. You have it all worked out. Have you ever talked to God in a way where you're educating him on your life and what he ought to do? And your prayers are very informative because you already know what you want. But he only, And you've prayed things that he has not answered. How many of you have unanswered prayers in your life right now? We all do because you don't know you're not God and he's doing something. You believe that he's hearing you, but he's not always responding the way that you want him to respond because he has a bigger picture in mind. God always sees the bigger picture, and he sees his plan and his kingdom. He's not joining you. God is not joining me in my journey in life. I'm joining him. Uh, he's not becoming a part of my story. I get tired of hearing about people's story. It's not your story. It's not my story. It's his story, and we join him. And then he always answers his prayers uh, uh, according to his plan. Hannah is going to pray. She's going to ask for a son, and God is going to give her Samuel. He's answering her individual prayer, yes, but he's also answering the prayer of his kingdom. Samuel would be the first priest, prophet, judge, a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ himself. And Hannah and Mary, the mother of Jesus, have a lot in common. If you, do the, if you research this out, the prayers that they pray, the way that they pray, be it unto me according to your will, just the way that they are, the, the prayer that they offer after they've been given the answer to their prayer, very similar. And God has the people of Israel in a critical time of transition where Samuel will actually be a prophet and a priest and a judge, one who hears from God. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. They weren't even familiar with the word of the Lord. When the word of the Lord comes to Samuel, Eli doesn't even realize it. Samuel, remember the story. Samuel goes into Eli and says, somebody, did you call for me? 
And, and Eli says, no, I didn't call for you. Go back to bed. He goes back to bed, and then he, he hears a voice again. He goes back into Eli, says to the, to the high priest, did you call for me? He said, no, go back into bed. About the third or fourth time, Eli says, I think God is talking to you. That's how rare the word of the Lord was. But God was going to use Samuel to anoint David. He was, going to, he was going to use Samuel to anoint Saul. He was going to use Samuel to speak to the people of God. So although he was answering an individual prayer of Hannah, and he knew her heart and he loved her, yet he was answering a prayer for the people of God and fulfilling his redemptive story on the earth. When you came to Jesus and gave your life to him, he did something miraculous in you. But he was doing something in the kingdom too, wasn't he? My mom was praying for me when I was in graduate school. I was away from God. I ran from God for reasons probably you're not familiar with. One, I wanted to do my, I wanted to do my own thing. Nobody else here, I'm sure, is like that. And the other thing, the other reason I found out later why I was running from God was because I was afraid that he would make me move away from my house and stand up in front of people and preach. <laughs> Silly me. My mom was praying for me, my dad too, but just somehow, especially my mom. Moms pray, don't they? Man, she would not, she would not relent. She drove me crazy when I was in graduate school. I would come home, a proud atheist, and there they'd be in their Bible study, <clears throat> dumb Christians, you know, in their Bible study, but they would not give up. She kept praying. I came to a point in my life where I gave my life back to Christ and it was, I mean, for me personally, of course, wonderful and salvation and all that, but God had a bigger plan in mind. He had, when you got saved, he had you in the kingdom of God and you and how you impact your family and you and how you impact the people at your work and you and how you impact your children and you and how, and everything that he has you doing in his kingdom. It's not just for you that you're saved, but it's for the kingdom of God. There's a bigger purpose. There's a bigger purpose. Matter of fact, if you're here today, we, and we're doing this all weekend, where, where, where you've got a child that maybe, maybe they're away from God like I was, or maybe they're just not serving the Lord the way that you know they could or should, and, and you're a parent and you've been praying for them, as long as they're not sitting next to you right now, uh, but you'd like, you're praying for your children. If, if that's you and they're kind of away from the Lord, would you raise your hand? I just want to agree with you in a quick prayer. Father, you see the hands of these parents right now. And Lord, I'm just asking you, you're no respecter of persons. No one person is more special than another. And Lord, I just ask you that the thing that you did in my life, you surrounded me with Christian people and you worked by the power of your Holy Spirit in ways that I, I didn't understand to bring me back to you. Father, we pray for every son and every daughter that they would have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, that they would see that Jesus really is the Christ and they would give their life to him. We're not giving up and we're not gonna stop praying, Father. As long as there's breath in our lungs, we're praying for our kids. We're asking you and we're trusting you and we're committing them to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. We believe in the power of prayer, amen. We're praying with you. We believe in the power of prayer, and this is one of the reasons that I selfishly created my own prayer team, that you would pray every day for the church and that you would pray every day for me. It's one of the benefits of being a pastor. There are a few benefits to being a pastor. One, I get close parking spaces at every hospital, clergy, you know what I'm talking about. Two, I can get into any prison I want to, thank you very much. And three, I can create my own selfish prayer team, send out texts, and have hundreds of people praying for me. Don't tell me you wouldn't do that if you could. I'm using my power for good right now. Now. So here's what you do. Text PRAY to 513-815-3639. You text PRAY and you're automatically on my prayer team. I will not text you at 2 o'clock in the morning. I will not. It'll be sometime during the day, every now and then, randomly, for what we're praying for for the weekend or something that's on my heart. And you'll get that text, and you're on our prayer team. already have over 300 people that are praying in that way. So thank you so much. That was the second commercial and the last commercial during this message. Back to the message. Now, here we go. 1 Samuel chapter 1, 4 through 8, the story goes on. On the days Elkanah presented his sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to Peninnah and each of her children. And though he loved Hannah, he would give her only one choice portion because the Lord had given her no children. 
So Peninnah, listen to this, the other wife, would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. Year after year, it was the same. Peninnah would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle, and each time Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. Why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask. Why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you have no children? Brace yourself. (laughs) You have me. Isn't that better than having ten sons? (laughs) This proves men have not changed over the ages. Sometimes, I don't know if any of you men can relate to this, but sometimes I know with my wife, I'm like having 10 sons, right? Me and my son actually get in trouble together. He's 11. I'm over 40. And she comes to him, and she's she's scolding him, and then she looks at me like, this happened this week. Really? Really? And I'm I'm being the mature man that I am. Tell her, he started it. (laughs) Elkanah actually said to her in her pain and her anguish, I know you're hurting, and I know this is bad, but you have me. (laughs) She was hurting. We've known and had many friends, folks of the church, who've struggled through infertility. I just want to say as your pastor today that as we're celebrating moms and Mother's Day and having games, I know that that this is a day that may be uh, substantially more difficult for those who are struggling with infertility or not being able to be a mom for whatever reason. The Lord knows. I just want you to know as a church, our hearts are with you and our prayers are with you. Um, and as a matter of fact, Stephanie and I will be right, right here, right after service. Every service we've been able to pray for folks who are just asking God. They're struggling with infertility, and if you are, uh, right after the service, just come up and, and let us pray together. The Bible says if you're struggling with something, you come to the elders of the church and let them lay hands on you and pray, and you pray a prayer of faith and just believe that God will speak to you and, and touch you. So we'll do that right after the service. But our hearts are with you. She was in anguish. She was in anguish. For Samuel, uh, verses 9 through 11, here's what it says. Now once... Once after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. This is happening year after year. Eli the priest was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle, the high priest, and Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made this vow, O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime, and as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. She is in anguish in her prayer. You know, in James it says, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. Fervent, fervency in prayer is simply this, an open heart during prayer. Sometimes when we think about a fervent prayer, we think, well, I need to feel a certain way or I need to get to a certain volume or I need to furrow my brow and clench my fists or maybe fall on the ground or, you know, there's certain people who are prayer warriors and they intercede for the nations and there's this sense of God doesn't want you to act anything up. He wants your heart to be open before him in prayer. So if you come before him with your heart open and she was in anguish, she just open-heartedly telling the Lord, I don't know what to do about this. I'll give you anything. And if you give me a son, I'm going to give the son back to you. Her heart was totally open to God. You can come to God in this way even if you're, you say, Lord, I'm just cold before you and I, I sense nothing of your spirit. You come before him. You open your heart and you tell him that. You're struggling with addiction. Does that keep you from prayer? Does your sin keep you from prayer? But shouldn't that force you into the presence of God where you can say, God, there is no help in heaven but from you. I can't do anything if you don't touch me. So help me in this, Father. Jesus actually said there was, there was one guy who stood in the back and said, I'm glad I'm not like these other sinners up in here. 
And then there was one who was at the front pounding on his chest in great humility saying, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner, I'm the worst one in the room. God would rather hear you honestly say you're the worst one in the room than piously hide behind some pride and and not admit what's going on in your heart. This is the beauty of prayer. That we have the right to come boldly before the throne of grace that that veil was torn in two, that we can actually walk into the Holy of Holies now by the blood of Jesus and make our request known, knowing that he hears us, that he cares for you. And this is how your faith grows. Your faith grows because uh, God begins to show you how trustworthy he really is, how big he actually is, because the point is not the size of your faith. The point is the size of your God. It's not your faith. It's what you put your faith in. If I gave you a canoe and said, go across the ocean, your faith would be small. (laughs) But if I gave you, uh, what are they called? The big things you get on? The cruise? A cruise ship. That's what I'm talking about. Ice cream (laughs) 24-7. You know what I'm talking about. They put a track on there like you're ever going to go work out while you're on that boat. Come on, people. If you're working out on a boat, you got the wrong idea. If I gave you one of these cruise liners, your faith would be big. Why? It had nothing to do with your faith. It had to do with what your faith was in. And when you pray this way open-hearted before God, you start to see how big he is, and your faith starts to match his size. Say, my God can do anything. Nothing is impossible for him. And he cares for me, and he hears me, and he knows me. This is fervent prayer, honest prayer. It goes on, 1 Samuel 1, 12 through 17. Now as she was praying to the Lord, (laughs) as she was praying to the Lord, Eli the priest watched her. Seeing her lips moving but hearing no sound, he thought she had been drinking. Is she surrounded by idiots or is it just me? In this story, must you come here drunk, he demanded. Throw away your wine. She said, no, sir. I have not been drinking wine or anything stronger, but I'm very discouraged. I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Isn't that great? Don't miss a day where you don't pour your heart out to the Lord. Don't think I'm a wicked woman, for I have been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. In that case, Eli said, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request that you have asked of him. She gets what she asks for. And then it goes on and says, and in due time she gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I asked the Lord for him. And Samuel means, God hears me. I want to encourage you today, keep on praying. There's things that you've been praying for for years. Keep on praying. Why? Because God is a God who hears you. Other idols in the world have no ears, they have no hands, they have no legs, they cannot move. But our God has emotions, he has a mind, he is real, and he has ears to hear. When his children cry, he hears you. He hears you. You can take it to the bank. And it goes on, 1 Samuel 1, 28. Therefore, she said, since I've been answered this prayer, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worship the Lord there. It's amazing that she received a son. But when you read the story, what is more amazing to me is that she received her son. You know how much she wanted this son. And then there comes a time when she actually is true to the promise that she made to the father, and she brought her son back. Imagine this. She brings her son back to the tabernacle and gives him to the Lord to be the priest. Gives him away. And this is an interesting part. I mean, this is critical. You want your prayers answered. This is a critical element to your prayers, to pray like Hannah. It says that she lent him to the Lord. I looked this up in the Hebrew. What does this actually mean? This actually means that as I prayed it, I was already relinquishing it. As I was asking for it, I was already taking my hands off of it. 
as I was praying and talking to the Lord about this issue in my work, in my family, in my job, in my finances, in my future, I had already released the answer to him. I believe this is a prayer that God likes. I don't know about you, but when I pray about stuff that I'm worried about, sometimes I'm hanging on to it. Huh? I'm praying, and I'm hanging on. And, and, and I feel like sometimes God and I are in a wrestling match. I'm saying, why won't you do something about this, God? Why won't you do something about this, God? I feel like sometimes he's saying, well, if you'd let go of it, I could help, I, I could help a brother out. But you seem to want to hang on to it. That's called worrying in God's general direction. It's prayer. It's prayer. But it's not this kind of prayer. Whatever the answer is, Father, I'm already committing the answer to you. If you say yes, then I'll say yes. But if you say no, I say no. If you say my grace is sufficient, for, but then your grace is sufficient. But I'm leaving the answer to you. I'm praying, and as I'm praying, and as I'm asking, I'm actually giving you the answer into your hands because I trust you. This is what she did. This is what she prayed. And this is what we want to do. We want to try this out this week. You've been praying about something. You've been going to God with it, but you know, and this is something you only know on the inside, that you have your hands all over it. And God's saying, while you ask me, relinquish it too and trust me with it. This is how her prayer was answered. Would you stand with me? Moment of honesty. Remind you, there's a prayer team up front as we close, and Stephanie and I will be down in the front. We'll be here as long as it takes. If you need to come down from the, from the top there, we'll be here uh, to pray with you. But now with every head up and every eye open, moment of honesty. You've been praying about something, but you feel like you've been holding on to it, holding on to the answer. Instead of praying and saying, God, as I ask, I'm giving this to you and I'm trusting you. I'm taking my hands off of it and I'm trusting you with it. Do you have an area in your life where you think, even in the smallest degree, yeah, that's me. That could be true. Would you be honest? Raise your hand. We're, we're going to pray. Father, you see our hands today and our hands are open and this is the way we want to pray. Lord, we want to grow in our trust in you, but we admit that we are like children and it seems like every time you do something in our life, the next obstacle we come to, we have to trust you all over again. I don't know why we're like that. But Lord, we just repent today. And the things that we're asking you for in our relationship, finances, future, job, all the stuff that we want to hang on to, God, as we ask you for it, we're releasing it to you. Do with it and with us what you desire. We trust you. Help us in this, Lord. I know that as soon as we leave today, we'll want to pick that thing back up. That's just the way we are. So help us, God, by your grace. Now I pray for your people today. I pray your blessing upon them wherever they go, Lord. I pray that they'd go in the power of your Holy Spirit, that there would be love and joy and peace and righteousness that would surround them as a shield. Go with them, I pray, and we thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.